Stevie Wonder once said that if he could play video games, you'd bet it would be Atari. Well, actually, no he didn't. That's a photoshop from him talking about a Mutron 3 synthesizer effect box. And you'd know that because Pac-Man came out on the 2600 in 1982 and not in 1981, which this flyer claims to have a copyright year of. But if he said that about Atari, I can see why. Or rather, can't see what- no, get out. That's not even funny! Fuck. Here we have my dad's Atari Lynx, which my mother got him when we moved to Australia in 1995, making it the console we've had the longest, at least since I was born anyway, because I've got dad's old game and watch as well as some other old random handhelds. As you can see, it's a pretty clean example of the Lynx, as dad barely used the thing. Didn't stop the battery cover from going missing, though. When it comes to batteries, it's the same as the Game Gear. It's customary to have a bucket full of them at your disposal because the Lynx chews and spits them out like an indecisive electronic piranha. Anyway, why are we looking at the Lynx? Because, well, look at the LCD screen. Sprinkled with pixels long since passed on, which neither I nor anyone knows how to fix. Well, not at the moment anyway. Hopefully in the future there's some magic that people do to fix that. As well as the fact that nothing else seems to display at all. However, if you tilt the screen to severe degrees of unpleasantness, you can just make out these vertical lines which do seem to change and move around in accordance to the game's location. Say if I were playing Double Dragon and I moved the character to the right, the lines would move to the left as though they were the background. Obviously we need a new screen and one is currently on its way all the way from the US as well as a spare power jack because, well, yeah along with some other things to fix a friend's game gear, which is completely dead. But while we wait for all that to happen, I'm going to recap this beast. Hopefully that will at least brighten the screen up or even make the sound a bit louder, who knows. So, first things first, let's get it open. Now the first thing you want to do is remove these rubber grips from the back, which at first may seem a little difficult, but after some time they become a lot easier to take off. I found my method of just sticking my nails underneath and just ripping it off the easiest way to do it, probably just because I don't have any specialised tools for the job. But as you can see, after removing the rubber grips you have four screw holes, with screws in them. <laughs> if there weren't any screws in them that'd be an issue. Always make sure there aren't any games connected while trying to take the back off. And when the back is removed there is still one more screw just down here in the battery compartment. And once that screw is undone, you have to figure out a way to remove the compartment from the board. Which for some people can be quite a daunting task, but I just... Blip, gone. Done. Now once the battery compartment's removed, you may think that the board is free to take over the world and all that, but no, there's some wiry things and ribbon cables to sort out first. And if you can keep up with my editing, you can see just how I did that. Now as I set down the board here, I can immediately see some damage caused by leaky capacitors and OH MY GOD THAT'S TOO CLOSE! DISGUSTING! GROSS! OH GOD THERE'S ANOTHER ONE! STOP IT! STOP! STOP IT! So these are the first two capacitors I'm going to remove for obvious reasons. But first I'm going to have to desolder this massive sheet of whatever to get to the points on the reverse side. To do that, at first I tried using this solder braid which was absolutely shit, and instead I just used a solder pump. And so that way it was removed. And now, here's unscripted camera me. Alright, so what I'm going to do now is show you how I remove a capacitor, or replace it, rather. I'm just going to demonstrate one of them. Let's start with C41. Right there, on the right. So that'll be these two points right here underneath. So what I'm going to do... Actually, can we go back to scripted, please? Thank you. What I did in a nutshell was add fresh solder to the old joints to help free it up a bit, and then while heating one side at a time, I rock the capacitor gently between my index finger and thumb on the other side, being careful not to remove any potentially fragile solder pads or traces. Once that one was removed, which you don't see very well because the camera died, I proceeded to add the appropriate replacement. 
Oh yeah, that's great mate, can you just get out of the fucking way? A lot of time passed, and with all of the caps replaced, it was time for an initial test. Which brought nothing new. It was the same dead pixel mess we had earlier, and no matter what I did, there was no signs of it coming to life. But if I'm not mistaken, it's a little bit louder. Let's turn it down a little bit. If that's the case, then that's pretty good. This, rather naturally, pissed me off, so I went to bed. But not before one final attempt. What's this? This is very random. It's just decided to work. I just, I was just going to bed and I decided, hey, I'll just turn it on and see what happens. And it's going again. And I've never actually seen this game before. Turning the brightness up a little bit more. Maybe not too much in case it does something. Ooh. Oh, okay. So it decided to die again. Brightness? No, does nothing. Okay, well, progress was made. So sometimes it wants to work, sometimes it doesn't. Seems fine at the moment. First time playing Double Dragon by the way, so I have no idea what I'm doing. But yeah, you get the main idea. It's, it's on and off. It either is or isn't. I tested the links with some other games and the screen checked out okay. But then a box arrived. Sent by a hero. So I just got a parcel in which was very, very well packaged, I must say, containing a Lynx screen for the Lynx 2, and it is not a McQuill LCD kit, it's just the standard old Atari Lynx screen. It confused me at first, so I thought, wait, hang on a second, I'm not doing a McQuill one. And that's some other components for the Lynx, including a spare power jack. So I can finally, okay, that's inside the bag, okay. So let's go ahead and try out the screen and install the little thingy. The power jack was the first of the two I decided to do, and it was a really simple process. I just heated the three points and removed the solder using the pump once again, leaving clear holes for the power jack to slip right on in. But make sure that the little notches are flush with the board. I soldered the first pin into place, so then I could use my other hand to push it flush with the notches by heating that point again. Then, well, it's obvious, I soldered the other two pins down into place. Now it's time to give it a go, the first time I've ever used the power supply. And of course, it works! Great. Then it was the turn of the screen. This was also really easy, if not even easier. You take out the four screws, remove the original screen, put the new one in, screw it into place, and start putting the system back together again. For testing purposes, you don't have to put it entirely back together, but anyway, here goes nothing. Did it work? Will it explode? Of course not! It's fine! Look at it, and wow, the screen is actually much clearer than the original. And no more deceased picture elements. Brilliant! Finally. After putting it all back together again, I can genuinely enjoy the Lynx. Y you know, without pretending, 2011 me. I also forgot to mention, I have an Atari Lynx. Now I'm not going to be playing this for very long, because this thing has a huge appetite for AA batteries. Yeah, because that's how you play hard driving, isn't it? Jesus Christ, what a fucking numpty. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, as always, I'll be back in 16 bits. So let's go ahead and try out this... Oh, shit.